Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India will be talking about head and neck paragangliomas. Paraganglia are organs made up of neuroendocrine cells which are derived from the neural crest. They can be classified as sympathetic and parasympathetic. They have a capacity to synthesize and secrete catecholamines and indolamines which are stored within neurosecretory granules along with a variety of proteins such as chromogranin A, chromogranin B and secretogranin. Sympathetic paraganglioma are those associated with the peripheral sympathetic nervous system. They lie in a paraaxial region of the trunk close to the sympathetic chains in paravertebral or prevertebral region in the pelvic and the retroperitoneal connective tissue. The adrenal medulla and the organ of Zucker candle which lie at the origin of the inferior mesenteric artery are the only ones which are visible to the naked eye while the others are smaller in size usually less than 1 mm. They secrete catecholamines in response to sympathetic neural stimulation and this is why they are positive with the chromaffin reaction. The main catecholamine which is produced by the adrenal medulla is epinephrine. Norepinephrine predominates in the extraadrenal sympathetic paraganglia. The parasympathetic paraganglia lie in the head and neck region close to vascular structures near the branches of the glossopharyngeal and the vagus nerves. In the region of the carotid body, the aorticopulmonary region, the intravagal and the jugulotympanic paraganglia have a chemoreceptor role and they respond to changes in oxygen pressure. This is why carotid body paraganglioma is more common in people living at high altitudes. Although they are innervated, they are not as densely innervated as sympathetic paraganglia. Parasympathetic paraganglia produce very little epinephrine but may contain high levels of dopamine and this is why the chromaffin reaction is negative. Coming to paragangliomas, these are neuroendocrine tumors whose development is closely related to alterations of the hypoxia pathway. They are very rare tumors with an annual incidence of 1 per 300,000 population. Majority of pa these paragangliomas arise in the head and neck, followed by the adrenal medulla and then in an extra adrenal location in the abdomen. Sympathetic tumors are present in the adrenal medulla and the organ of Zucker candle, whereas parasympathetic paragangliomas are commonly seen in the carotid body, accounting for majority of them, followed by the jugulotympanic paragangliomas. They are known by various terminologies previously such as chemodectoma, glomus tumor and non-chromaffin paragangliomas. A positive family history is present in about 10 to 50 percent of these patients. The overall incidence of head and neck paragangliomas is about 1 in 30,000 to 1 in 100,000 population. The sites as mentioned previously the most common is the carotid body paraganglioma followed by the jugular bulb paraganglioma, the vagal paraganglioma which is seen near the uh, 10th cranial nerve, the tympanic paraganglioma which is present along the tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve and the cervical sympathetic chain paragangliomas. Less than 3% of head and neck paragangliomas secrete catecholamines. Coming to the clinical features of head and neck paragangliomas, the median age at diagnosis is around 50 years and they have a wide age range. They are rarely observed in children as well. They are more common in females as compared to males. They may be bilateral or multifocal in about 25% of cases. They present as a painless enlarging mass with tympanic paragangliomas typically presenting with hearing loss and pulsatile tinnitus while laryngeal paragangliomas present with shortness of breath, hoarseness and strider. Phenotypically, they are parasympathetic which is why they are rarely functional. However, in less than 1% of patients, they can present with hypertension, anxiety and palpitations. Coming to the histopathological features, the classic features of paraganglioma that is the cell balance pattern is seen in these tumours when nests of uniform polygonal cells known as chief cells containing abundant eosinophilic to amphophilic granular cytoplasm are surrounded by sustentacular cells. These sustentacular cells at the periphery of the tumour cells have a paracrine role and they are separated by a rich capillary network. 
Other features of these tumors are the presence of nuclear pseudo inclusions, past positive intracytoplasmic hyaline globules, and secondary changes may be seen in these tumors when they are long standing, such as hemorrhage, hemosiderin deposition, and sclerosis. In this image, you can see that S100 staining highlights the sustentacular cells which are present at the periphery of the tumor cells. On higher magnification, we can frequently see trabecular architecture and diffuse growth as well in some cases. Some rare cases may show the presence of large cells with vesicular nuclei and prominent nucleoli and these are known as chromaffin-like cells. Oncocytic cells as well as spindle cells may also be seen. A rare type of paraganglioma is the small cell paraganglioma where the tumor cells are very small in size. Also extensive sclerosis may be present as seen in this image so that these cells resemble an invasive neoplasm. Richly vascularized paragangliomas also known as angioma like vas paragangliomas due to their rich vascularity can be mistaken for hemangiomas and similar tumors. Some paragangliomas show predominance of clear cells and these may resemble metastasis from a renal cell carcinoma. Other changes that may be seen include presence of pigment within the tumor cells which is neuromelanin or lipofuscin and this would lead to the tumor mimicking a melanoma. So these differential diagnoses need to be kept in mind. On occasion, the tumors may have an irregular interface with the surrounding soft tissue or bone. Here you can see that the tumor cells are going within the bony trabeculae or they might show the present and here you can see that they are present surrounding a nerve twig. Pre the background may also show inflammatory changes. Tumor cells may be embolized within vessels and necrosis may also be present. However, these are not features of malignancy. Here you can see that there is quite significant nuclear pleomorphism with hyperchromasia and enlarged nuclei but this also is not a feature of malignancy in paragangliomas. A staging system has been provided for paragangliomas. This is the grading of adrenal pheochromocytoma and paragangliomas system by Kimura in 2014 also known as the GAP score. This is based on the presence of, of the histological pattern, the cellularity of the tumors, the presence or absence of necrosis and the presence or absence of vascular or capsular invasion. The MIB1 labeling index has also been incorporated into this scoring system. A score of 0 to 2 is classified as a well differentiated type while a score of 3 to 6 is called the moderately differentiated type. A score of 7 to 10 would be classified as a poorly differentiated type and when you see the outcome of these three types you can see that the well differentiated type of paraganglioma has a very good outcome as compared to the moderately differentiated and the poorly differentiated has the worst outcome. Coming to the differential diagnosis of head and neck paragangliomas, it primarily depends on the location of the tumor. If the tumor is present in the neck, you should consider the possibility of a lymph node with metastasis from other neuroendocrine tumors such as uh, carcinoids, medullary carcinoma of the thyroid and Merkel cell carcinoma. Hyalinizing trabecular tumors are also seen in the lower neck as they arise from the thyroid and these tumors are cytokeratin positive unlike paragangliomas of the head and neck. Soft tissue tumors like glomangioma would enter the differential diagnosis of very vascular appearing paragangliomas. However, these are characterized by the presence of a pericellular reticular network which is not seen in paragangliomas. Paragangliomas on the other hand show a reticulin framework surrounding the nest of tumor cells. In the middle ear, the differential diagnosis of a paragangioma would be a meningioma or a hemangioma or a middle ear adenoma depending on the morphology of the tumor. Coming to the larynx, the possibility of a neuroendocrine tumor needs to be excluded as atypical carcinoids are more frequent in the larynx as compared to paragangliomas. To confirm the differential diagnosis, we can use an immunohistochemical panel with chromogranin, synaptophysin which are neuroendocrine markers and would be positive in all of these tumors. However, S100 would show positivity in the sustentacular cells in a paraganglioma and would not be seen in a neuroendocrine tumor or in medullary carcinoma of thyroid. EMA positivity may, free, may occasionally be present in neuroendocrine tumors as well as in medullary carcinoma but is not seen in paragangliomas. Similarly, pancytokeratin may rarely be seen in paragangliomas, however, neuroendocrine tumors as well as medullary carcinoma of thyroid are always positive for cytokeratin. Calcitonin and CEA are two markers which would be positive in medullary carcinoma of thyroid but are not expressed by paragangliomas. 
Next, we come to the familial paraganglioma syndromes. These tumors have been found to have the highest degree of heritability among human neoplasms and at least 40% of pa paragangliomas are hered hereditary. At least 19 susceptibility genes have been identified and a number of syndromes are seen with the most common being the familial para, uh, paraganglioma pheochromocytoma syndrome also known as the Carney stratakis syndrome. Paraganglioma's are also seen in multiple neuro, uh, endocrine neoplasia or men syndrome in the types 2A and 2B. They are also seen in von hippel lindau VHL syndrome and neurofibromatosis type 1. Other rarer genes have also been identified and to a susceptibility to developing these tumors. Most of these have an autosomal dominant mode of inheritance except for the RET gene and the HIF2 alpha genes in which these are gain of function mutations. And a parent of origin effect is seen in some of these syndromes where the transmission can occur from either parent and the affected child develops paraganglioma only if the mutated gene was received from the father. This is known as paternal transmission. And it, this results in generation skipping which is very important in taking the family history of these patients. And this is seen in paraganglioma 1 syndrome and paraganglioma 2 syndrome. A genotypic and phenotypic correlation has been identified in the paraganglioma syndromes and they have identified two clusters which uh, with the first being the pseudo hypoxia pathway and the second being related to the kinase signaling pathways. And the, the cluster 1 includes genes with uh, tumors with SDHB, SDHD, VHL mutations and sporadic non-adrenergic paragangliomas whereas cluster 2 includes RET, NF1 altered and sporadic adrenergic paragangliomas. And there is a difference in the clinical presentation as well as histopathology with the dopamine and mixed dopamine producing tumors of cluster 1 showing an image of phenotype being present in extra adrenal locations presenting at an early age and showing a malignant tendency and these usually have SDH mutations. The norepinephrine producing tumors have an immature secretory phenotype. They are seen in adrenal as well as extra adrenal locations. These again present at an early age and they are occasionally malignant and they, may, they usually show the presence of VHL mutations. Cluster 2 tumors are those which produce epinephrine and these have a mature secretory phenotype. They are present in adrenal locations and present at a later age and these are rarely malignant. These tumors show the presence of RET and NF1 mutations. Coming to the SDH genes which are the most commonly altered genes in these patients, most cases of head and neck paraganglioma result from mutations in 5 genes belonging to the SDH complex. The most common of these is the SDHD gene accounting for 80% of all mutations in these followed by SDHB, SDHAF2 and SDHA and SDHC being relatively uncommon. These genes encode for the heterodimeric SDH complex which is a component of the mitochondrial respiratory chain complex 2 and the Krebs cycle. They are paraganglioma syndromes 1 to 5 for each of these genes and a 3P association or 3P syndrome is described where you have paragangliomas, pheochromocytomas and pituitary adenomas. Carney stratakis syndrome as I mentioned earlier is a paraganglioma which is present along with a gastrointestinal stromal tumor or GIST. This syndrome has autosomal dominant inheritance with incomplete penetrance and they have SDHD, SDHC or SDHB mutations. Carney triad is different from Carney stratakis syndrome and in this triad we get pheochromocytomas, paragangliomas, GIST and pulmonary chondromas which are mostly seen in females. In this syndrome, SDHC gene is deleted or shows aberrant DNA hypermethylation. Coming to the pathogenetic mechanism of the uh, SDH alterations in the SDH genes, when the gene is mutant, succinate accumulates within the cell and prevents uh, prolyl hydroxylation of HIF1 alpha by inhibiting PHD. HIF1 alpha is stabilized and forms a heterodimer which promotes expression of target genes VEGF and GLUT1 which are downstream. This enables emergence of a pseudo hypoxia signature. 
When we look at the mutations that are most frequent in head and neck paragangliomas, majority of them show SDHB and SDHD mutations and these mutations are seen in about 45% of these patients. And patients who have multiple tumors show mutations in a higher frequency as high as 90%. Again, patients with multiple tumors in head and neck as well as other locations have a high frequency of SDH mutations as high as 85%. If we look at the data from this study, which had uh, 228 head and neck paragangliomas from 193 patients, it was shown that 84.3 of these had a mutation in the known susceptibility genes, most commonly the SDHX genes and followed by the NF1 genes. Carotid body paragangliomas, sympathetic chain paragangliomas, multifocal paragangliomas, metastatic paragangliomas and bilateral carotid body paragangliomas had SDH mutations in 100% of cases. Coming to the head paraganglioma syndromes and the genotype phenotype correlations, these are the various genes that are altered SDHD, SDHAF2, SDHC, SDHB, SDHA, VHL, RET, NF1 and TMEM127. The inheritance of majority all of these is autosomal dominant, however SDHD and SDHAF2 show paternal transmission as I have mentioned earlier. These are the most frequently deleted genes, the SDHD, the SDHAF2, SDHC and SDHB. And multiple patients with multiple tumors are those who have SDHD, SDHAF2 and SDHB mutations. The risk of metastasis is highest in patients with tumors which are SDHB mutated. And pheochromocytomas and uh, thoracic and abdominal paragangliomas are present along with head and neck paragangliomas in SDHD and SDHB mutated tumors. Next we come to the role of immunohistochemistry in head and neck paragangliomas. It has multiple functions, one of which is diagnostic, next is for identification of hereditary cases and lastly for risk stratification. Coming to the diagnostic role of immunohistochemistry, it has an important confirmatory role when the morphology is not typical, also when a tumor first presents as metastatic disease and for confirmation of ectopic hormone secretion like adrenocorticotrophic hormone which can occasionally be secreted by a paragangliomas. The markers that are commonly used are synaptophysin and chromogranin with the latter being more specific. And the sustentacular cells are positive for S100 and glial fibrillary acidic protein. Next we come to role of IHC in testing for hereditary syndromes. As I have already mentioned about 40% of paragangliomas are hereditary with germline mutations in the SDH complex genes, in the VHL syndrome, in men type 2, NF1 and uh, some rarer syndromes and these have significant implications for the patients and their family. So this is why it has been recommended that all patients with pheochromocytoma and paragangloma be offered some degree of genetic testing for germline mutations. However, the depth of testing depends primarily on the local resources that are available and the pre-test probability of hereditary disease. For identifying this, we can use immunohistochemical markers. SDHB immunohistochemistry is available for identifying SDH deficient paragangliomas. It is a rapid, reliable and a cheap diagnostic tool which can be used for as a screening method to, to triage patients who need to be tested for germline mutation. Negative staining for SDHB is present when there is a biallelic inactivation that is a germline mutation or deletion of any one of the SDH genes. Because once any of these genes is mutated, there is a destabilization of the SDH complex which results in a loss of the SDHB protein which is a part of the catalytic core. This marker is positive in almost all sporadic cases or in association with other hereditary syndromes which gives it a sensitivity of 100% and a specificity of about 85%. This is an image which shows that normally a tumor, tumor cells would should diffuse granular cytoplasmic staining because of the presence of mitochondria which take up the stain and in tumors where there is loss of the marker you can see that there is an internal control where the endothelial cells and sustentacular cells would show granular staining whereas the tumor cells show loss of staining. 
in paragangliomas which are associated with SDHD mutation, there is an unusual pattern where the cytoplasm shows a diffuse pale blush. You can see that the intensity of staining is stronger in the endothelial cells which is the internal control while the tumor cells are showing pale staining of the cytoplasm. This is to be interpreted as negative SDHB staining and not as positive staining. Weak and very focal but granular staining can also be seen in VHL mutated cases and it may be incorrectly interpreted as negative. So whenever the staining is, une is equivocal, the genetic testing should be done. Embolization and trauma to the tumor during surgery may result in decreased STHB staining leading to false positive result. So this should also be considered when making a final impression of whether mutation is present or not. SDH A IHC is also present for SDH deficient with paragangliomas and it is seen there is loss of this stain in SDH A germline mutated cases. In other SDH mutated cases, SDH A staining is preserved. Due to the low penetrance of SDH mutation, the utility of SDH A IHC is quite limited as this mutation is rare and this and SDH B screening would identify all cases that you would like to undergo genetic testing. So SDH A staining is not recommended. Other immunohistochemical markers which can detect familial syndromes include fumarate hydratase and S2 succinocysteine immunohistochemistry which identify germline fumarate hydratase mutation. Here again you can see that there is an internal control which is present while the tumor cells are showing loss of staining. This is the higher magnification of the same where the endothelial cells and sustentacular cells are showing staining whereas the tumor cells are not staining positively with this marker. However, these antibodies are not commercially available at present and hopefully in future they will be available to identify these cases and send them for genetic testing for fumarate hydratase genes. Another mutation that is seen in familial paragangliomas is germline mutations in the MYC associated factor gene or MAX gene which is seen in 1% of paragangliomas which are familial. And this gene encodes for a protein known as the MAX protein which is the a transcription factor which regulates cell proliferation, differentiation and apoptosis. Paragangliomas not associated with MAX mutation can also show loss of MAX expression which is why the role of this immunohistochemical marker is still to be validated. H3F3A mutations may also be seen in multiple paragangliomas and giant cell tumor of bone syndrome. However, this immunohistochemical marker still remains to be validated for paragangliomas. This is a protocol that has been provided for testing of uh, head and neck paragangliomas. First, SDHB immunohistochemistry should be performed and if it is retained, then the testing should be performed for VHL, fumarate, hydratase and RET genes. If there is loss of SDHB IHC, then SDH A IHC can be performed and if it is lost, it would indicate SDH A mutation. If SDH B is negative and SDH A is positive, it could be a mutation of any one of the other SDH genes. Coming to immunohistochemistry for risk stratification, all paragangliomas do have some metastatic potential. However, at present there is no means to identify those paragangliomas which will behave aggressively using standard histopathological techniques. This is because these tumors are quite rare. They occur in sites where basement membrane penetration cannot be assessed which is the hallmark of malignancy in epithelial tumors. There is a low incidence of metastasis with a long latent period as much as 20 years which is why it is difficult to follow up most of these patients. And soft tissue invasion has been seen in benign tumors as well which do not metastasize. So this is why it is a poor predictor of metastasis. Possibly there is a different biological basis of metastasis which is related to the tumor genotype rather than the phenotype and leads to aggressive behavior and metastasis. A number of immunohistochemical markers have been used to uh, perform risk stratification. These include angiogenesis markers and regulators such as VEGF receptor, VEGF, VEGF1 and 2 cell adhesion and extracellular matrix molecules and regulators such as tenacin C, E-cadherin, N-cadherin, CD44, N-cam and heparinase, 
transcription factors involved in epithelial mesenchymal transcription uh, like SNAIL, proliferation and cell cycle related markers like KI67, P53, MDM2, retinoblastoma protein, BCL2, cyclin D1, P21 and P27, telomerase complex proteins such as uh, HTERT, granin fragments like secretogranin and other miscellaneous proteins like HSP90 and HIF2-alpha. Of these, the KI67 proliferative index is the one which has been shown to a role that with more than 3 to 5 percent labeling index being associated with aggressive behavior and which is why it has been included as a component in the GAP scoring system. However, it has shown discrepant results as with other markers as the scoring methodology is not consistent with blind eyeballing being done in by most people and this is uh, not reproducible. SDHB mutation has been in, uh, associated with increased risk of metastasis which is now which is why it has now been incorporated into the GAP score giving uh, rise to the modified GAP system. However, this needs to be studied further before it can be made uh, validated. So, to conclude a significant proportion of head and neck paragangliomas are hereditary and it is time to question the previous weight and watch paradigm of no surgery to the cranial nerves and no FNAC due to bleeding because we do need to identify which of these patients have a familial syndrome so that families may also be tested genetically. And these various syndromes do confer different implications for patient management which is why it is important to identify them. And Although clinical genetic testing may be limited by available resources, it should be offered to those patients when available and a pathologist has a central role in identifying which patients should be uh, after screening should be triaged for genetic testing. Thank you.